Today's guest is Cameron Harold. He was the COO of 1-800-GOT-JUNK. When he joined the company, it had less than $2 million in revenue and only 14 employees. He grew that company over six years to over $100 million and 3,100 employees. Find out today how he did this. He's also an author. He's the author of Double Double and Meeting Suck. He had also, before 1-800-JUNK, had grown two other companies to over $100 million. You want to know how to scale your business? Stay tuned. Cameron will show you. Welcome to this edition of Peak Performers Podcast with your host, Thor Conklin. Thor will be sharing the necessary tools, strategies, and psychology you'll need to become a peak performer in any area of your life or business. Cameron, thank you very much for joining us today. I've been looking forward to this interview. Uh, we've had a chance to, we met several years ago at an EO event uh, where I heard you speak. Amazing. Uh, talking about that uh, 1-800-GOT-JUNK. And, you know, it was interesting because your name came up again. We've been friends on social media for a number of years. And yep. your name came up with a, a guy that I had met, an amazing individual, Brad uh, Weimert. Uh, Weimert. Um, <laughs> I was interviewing him a couple of weeks ago and he goes, yeah, you know, I was, we were doing this Everesting event where you climb up Mount Stratton for 17 times for the equivalent of Mount, uh, for the equivalent of Mount Everest. And Brad decided to do it twice as many times as everybody else, 34 times. And yeah. No one yeah. knew what he was doing. And uh, I said, so how'd you do it? He goes, I, you know, he went through the process and he goes, I, I was really down. He goes, I didn't think I could finish it. I don't think I could reach my goal. And I had to call the one guy that I know that could make, you know, get me through it. Cameron Harold. And I'm like, wait a second. You got to be kidding. Tell me what he told you. So tell the audience what you told Brad. Sure. Um, it's funny because I was actually at an event last week and I was telling Jesse Itzler, who is the living with the seal guy, I was telling him that Brad and I were friends and he, Jesse just kind of rolled his eyes going, dude, I've never seen anything like it. So uh, Brad had, had done 24 of the 34 laps. And again, 140 people were doing this summoning of Everest and, uh, only 50% finished and it was the night before he had 10 laps still to go and he was just sounding really dejected and he was making a couple of video posts that it wasn't possible the math couldn't work out and I just pushed him and said you know you still got a lot more in your tank than you think you do like regardless of any race you ever do you've always got more left like I did a marathon two years ago and I remember finishing going all right it really was hard but god there's a lot of spots where I probably could have pushed it you've always got more in the tank you just you just never give up until it's over and it's not over. And I said, if you have to get up in the middle of the night and, and walk down the hill, like just, just walk down a few times instead of taking, waiting for the gondola to start, but whatever, you just don't give up. And he got up in the morning and said, all I need to do is go 15% faster than my first 24 laps, which is reality is, is impossible. <laughs> um, and, and he did it and he, he did all 34 laps with about 15 minutes to spare and, and um, no one else had even come close to that record. Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, just seeing him jog or almost sprint from the gondola back up to the start line and then just keep going. He was just a machine. He just kept going, going, going. And, it, you know, it was interesting because when I did it, I did it alone. I did not finish. I got 12 out of a 17 and I try to pace myself and get some good rest, wake up the next day. And then, of course, my times kept getting slower. And what I didn't realize is, and it happened to everyone, the last third of their ascents actually got quicker. We actually got more strength. It, it was interesting. It wasn't the weather. It wasn't anything else. It was just adrenaline. You were strong in the beginning, and then you were strong at the end. It's just the middle that sucks. That's really cool. <laughs> so, um, speaking about sucking, I know you have a brand new book out. It does not suck, by the way. But the, <laughs> the name of the book is uh, "Meetings Suck." And I was thinking about that. I said, you know, meetings aren't bad. It's just the people that run the meetings that suck. So well, it's, it's the people that run them and it's also the people that attend them. And, and the reality is I was coaching a client. So I've worked with a, a YPO company in Florida for around four and a half years now. I've coached them, them and their team. They just raised $255 million last year from Warburg Pincus. And I've coached them from about 60 up to 500 employees. And they were complaining about meetings last year and how they sucked. And I said, well, have you and the leadership team ever been trained on how to run meetings? CEO said no. And I said, well, what about your employees? Have they ever been trained on how to attend and participate and, and how meetings are supposed to run? And he said, no. And then I said, well, of course meetings suck. Like if we don't know what we're doing, then it sucks. It's kind of like little league baseball. 
you know, we would never send our kid off to little league without teaching him how to hold a ball and throw a ball and, and hold the bat. Like we, we would set them up for complete failure and they would think baseball sucks when in fact it's really fun, but you need to know the basics. So I just codified the basics of how to run highly effective meetings. And a third of the book is written on how to run them. A third is how to show up and participate and, and attend them. And then a third is the proper meetings you need to actually scale a high growth company with a great culture. You know, you're making me feel like a bad parent right now because I remember when my son was five and we were going out to uh, the little league. It was actually the church league. I had not gone through some of the basics. We, we practiced on hitting him and doing everything. And I realized he gets up to bat and he doesn't know what to do after he hits the ball. We never worked to ran the break. Right. So I was like, time out, Chase. What you got to do is you got to hit the ball and then you run to first base. I walked back to the bleachers. I'm like, wait a second. I've got to tell him to drop the bat first. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, the, and kids feel a little bit stupid in that moment, right? Like intuitively, they know they don't know what they're doing. And that's really what we've done to our employees. Without training our employees on how to, to run meetings, on how to interview people, on how to deal with conflicts, situational leadership, coaching, delegation, how are they supposed to figure this out by failure? And I think it's really stupid to let our employees fail. I think the leader's job, whether it's the CEO or their leadership team, is to grow people. That's really the primary job of the leader. The, the secondary, the primary job of the CEO is vision. And then the secondary job really for everybody is to, to grow people. You know, it's yeah. not, not to do work. Yeah, and it's so interesting because you find very few organizations that actually spend a lot of time and resources and actually doing that. They just expect everyone to show up and know what to do. And it's almost this, uh, they throw them into the fire and say, okay, just do it. And if they can't do it, let's get somebody else. Well, it's interesting. I even started a, a group about a year and a half ago now called the COO Alliance, which is the only network of its kind in the world for the second in command. You know, there's almost an inordinate number of groups for entrepreneurs. We've got EO and YPO and Vistage, and Mastermind Talks and Maverick and GoBundance and you know, like all of these places where, where entrepreneurs can go learn. But where are they taking their COO? They're really the person who's actually making the company grow for the visionary. Where, where are these integrators going to learn from each other? There's no place for them. So what we kept doing was bringing the COO to all these EO events or the YPO events where they don't fit. You know, they're, they're networking with all these visionaries, with all these entrepreneurs, and they know they didn't really fit in. And I wanted a place for them to be able to grow their skill set. It's such an important role. You know, many of our clients talk about, you know, how do I get out of the grind of, of this business? I always feel like I'm, uh, I'm at the center of it. I'm the leader of it. But th they have poor or no COO um, or what I really call is the second in command, the, the guy yeah. that really gets the thing done. Yeah, well, and it's funny, I was actually just written up in um, this issue of Fortune magazine, the, the, uh, the April edition, talking about the second in command. They interviewed Sheryl Sandberg from Facebook and myself around the role of the COO. And they're, 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 um, a, a lot of companies keep struggling where the entrepreneur is trying to do it or trying to figure out how to do it. The reality is all they should be doing is articulating vision and growing people and then getting out of the way and growing their team. But before you hire a COO or a second in command, I think the real thing that the, the entrepreneur needs to do is hire an executive assistant. Yes. And it's astounding to me how many, how many EOers or YPOers still don't have an EA. And if you don't have an executive assistant, you are one. Yeah, no question. And it doesn't take that much nowadays. You know, it, it doesn't really do. I've got a client that, you know, they've got a business over hundred million, very profitable. And the two leaders don't have assistants. I'm like, what are you doing? What, what well, are you? It doesn't make sense why they would even do $15 an hour jobs. Like, you know, one of my clients never actually now fills up his car with gas. I said, there's no, he told me he had to go fill up his car with gas and get a car wash. And I said, that should be done for you every Wednesday or every Monday and every Thursday during your two team meetings that you have. Your assistant should go out and get the car washed and, and uh, filled up with gas for you so you don't have to think about it. He goes, yeah, but it's only a half hour. And I'm like, well, but that is a half hour that you could be practicing your golf swing or hanging out with your wife or, or, you know, meditating or like, or getting some work done that's high valued. So if we can get everything off our plate that's below our effective hourly wage or get everything off our plate that, that drains us of energy so that all we do are the, the really high functioning, unique ability roles, then we win. And, and I think they lose sight of that where they just, they work hard, they work hard, they work hard. Yeah, it's almost a badge of honor. I mean, I haven't filled my car, had my car washed for the last six months. My assistant does it. As a matter of yeah. fact, when I put together the, the description, it also said, walk the dog. And she goes, what kind of dog do you have? I said, I don't have a dog. But when I get a dog, I want to make sure that's included as well because I don't want to be bothered with that. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> she kind of jokes. She says, you need like a rental wife. I'm like, no, an assistant will be fine. 
The system will work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we want to make this a long-term uh, successful marriage here. Yeah. So, Cameron, it really comes down to execution. Everything that we're talking about with our clients is all about execution. Why don't people execute? Well, it's funny, Thomas Edison once said that vision without execution is hallucination. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to people are busy being busy. You know, they wake up in the morning and they just start working on their email. Um, I have a daily accountability partner. So I have somebody, another CEO, Joe Polish, and Joe and I set our daily top three goals with each other using an app called Commit to Three, uh, which was actually designed by an EO that I taught at the EMP program. But you wake up in the morning and the first thing you do is you set your top three things you're going to get done for the day. And just that little bit of focus and built-in accountability is huge. So I think that's one. Um, I think a lot of people don't execute because they're not really sure where they're going. So they, they kind of follow the big shiny objects. You know, the Cheshire Cat said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs and their companies aren't focused on, on a vision. They're not focused on goals. They're not focused on roles and responsibilities. And they're just... They're just busy being busy and, and they're distracted. That's usually what it comes down to. Yeah, without that clarity, it's too easy to say yes to things. And I find the most highly successful executives, business owners are ones that, that their default is no. No, that doesn't fit into where I'm going or what I'm doing. Yeah, I think we have to get a lot better at saying no more often than we say yes. And, and I've actually started saying no to a lot more podcast interviews now if the audience isn't big enough or isn't targeted enough because... There's just simply too many opportunities for me to say yes to press and I need to say yes to the right ones. Um, same thing with, with events that I go to. Like next, next week, I'll be five full days at the TED conference and this will be my sixth year going to the main stage TED conference. And I kind of every year go, is, is there a high enough, high enough ROI? Like, will I be spending time with my clients? Will I be new, meeting new clients? Will I be generating ideas? I'm a part of four main mastermind groups. You know, I go to the Genius Network. I'm in Dan Sullivan's personal 10X for strategic coach. I go to mastermind talks and I go to Ted just came back from baby bathwater. You know, there's only so many events that I can do as well. Right. So it's really filtering every, I put everything through what I call an impact filter so that I can decide whether there's a high enough impact and what the ROI is going to be. Yeah, you, you absolutely have to, you know, when you did, um, 1-800 got junk, I'm sure there were some things that you did that were just brilliant. Otherwise you wouldn't have produced the results that you, you did. I'm sure there's some things that you tried. I was just like, well, that was a bad idea. What were some of the lessons that you learned throughout that process? Wow. Um, it's funny because in chapter, my, the last chapter of my first book, Double Double, I talked about all the lessons to my 16-year-old self. You know, it was all the true business lessons that I wish that I'd known at a younger age that I truly did learn over my years of building, not just 1-800-GOT-JUNK, but also a couple of my, my two EO qualifying companies were prior to, uh, to me joining my forum mate to build his company, 1-800-GOT-JUNK. One was um, when you're hiring senior people is to listen to them. You know, that, that we had a very senior uh, head of finance and he was very quiet. And he was very analytical, very amiable. And he would tell us to be careful with our cash and we would just keep spending it. And we thought because we had cash in the bank, we could spend it. We didn't need bank financing. And then all of a sudden we kind of got caught. You know, cash is your oxygen and we didn't have enough to meet payroll. And we, we kind of looked at him and he kind of shrugged his shoulders as if to say, I told you so. And we realized, or I realized, that when you hire people, you need to slow down and give them the chance to speak. You know, otherwise, why are you bringing them into the meeting in the first place? Why are you bringing them onto your team in the first place? And when Brian and I were so dominant, so expressive, and such drivers, uh, we would just steamroll over them, and we would think that we were unstoppable. And to his, what's the point of having them on the team then? So one of the exercises I do now in meetings is I give everyone a stack of Post-it notes, and I get all the employees to write down their ideas one idea per post-it note. And then I get them to read out their post-it notes and put them up on the wall during the meeting. So you start with the most junior employees or the newest employees first, and you finish with the CEO speaking last. So in every meeting, the CEO speaks last. And that's another great way to grow people. Whereas most entrepreneurs come in and they do all the talking and delegating and well, what's the point? Like you're not growing your people. The only way you're really going to scale your company is to grow people. So you flip it. So that was one big lesson. Um, I'd say another one was, was just related to energy that, that you really spend so much of your time with the wrong people that you're not giving your grain to your best horses. And if your A players are the race horses, your B players are the workhorses, the C players have to go to the glue, fact, the glue factory. And I think we spend a lot of time with our C players um, 
which really is hurting our A's. You know, the A players are going, why don't you spend time with me when you're spending time with, you know, the guy who's not getting the results or is the wrong core value fit. So it's really working to get the wrong people out of the company more proactively than we do today. Yeah, no question. I see that affects so many organizations. I actually did a a podcast a couple, uh, probably about a year ago talking about, you know, it, it, your team's almost like a, a group in a boat and you're all rowing and you've got people that are actually sitting there rowing. You've got other ones that are just kind of like faking like they're rowing. But then at the end, you've got this line going over the back of the boat and you've got, you know, it just looks like a line into the water, but you actually got somebody down there in the bottom holding the line, dragging their feet. And those are your C players. And yeah. <laughs> they're not helping at all and they just kind of go into the radar but we spend all this time trying to get them back in the boat and try to get them productive <laughs> and our a players are just sitting there why, why do we have these c players yeah like, what are they doing um i had a merchant acquisition expert on um price pritchett the third who wrote uh you squared amazing i know price <laughs> yeah pr amazing guy I've known Price. I wish I could find my copy of E Squared right in front of me. It's, it's either on the bedside. I just grabbed it again the other day. Um, Price is, I've known Price for probably 30 years. I met him in uh, 1989. He's amazing. He's yeah. like the guy you don't know. Um, he's got 20 million books in print. Yeah, I don't know why people don't know him as well as they should either. He, amazing. He, just, he was talking about mergers where 25% of the people are on board with it, 25% aren't on board, and then 50 are kind of in the middle going, I'm not quite sure if we're on board or not. And we spend all our time trying to get the 25% that's not on board on board. Yeah. Never gonna, you know, many times they're not going to get on board. Spend your time on the 50 and the 25 that are already on board and get that 75% group uh, moving forward. That's how you win. That's how you win. Yeah. Did, did I hear you correctly that the uh, creator of 1-800-GOT-JUNK was a form made of yours? Yeah, so this is what, what a lot of people don't know. So I, I actually joined EO back when it was YEO in 1995. Yeah. Uh, I was a partner in a chain of auto body collision repair shops. We built that up and then took the company public. And then I left and became president of a private currency company. And in fact, very similar to kind of what Bitcoin is doing today. But we had 30,000 companies 20 years ago using our digital currency instead of the U.S. dollar. And it was backed by nothing other than people's faith in our currency. So we had Starwood Hotels and Avis Rent-A-Car, Budget Rent-A-Car, Hard Rock Cafe, oh God, Bose, Bose Stereos. They all used our currency instead of the U.S. dollar for transactions. Um, so we built that company up. And then I left there as we sold the company to another U.S. public company in October of 2000. And I joined Brian. Brian and I had been in forum together for four years at that point. He joined our forum when he had five trucks and was doing $997,000 in revenue. And I remember when we were like, I don't know, he's kind of young and he has a garbage business and why would we let him into our forum? We're too cool, right? <laughs> uh, and then, then we met him and we thought, well, he's, he's young and he's cool, but what the hell, we'll let him in. So just being in forum and around him, and I'd built two franchise companies at that point. I'd already built College Pro Painters. I opened the West Coast of the United States for the world's largest residential house painting company. And then we did franchising and auto body. So Brian kept pegging me for ideas and I knew how to grow his company. So he asked me if I would work for him. I said, no, I'm not going to work for you. That'd be like kissing my sister. <laughs> but I said, I will, I'll coach you and I'll work behind the scenes teaching your team and I'll just bill you by the hour. And, um, at the end of three months, he's like, dude, I can't do this. Like you're charging me 17 hours a day. I'm like, yeah, but I'm working 17 hours a day. Like I showed him and he's like, fuck, he goes, you need to come on full time. And I said, yeah, you're right. Cause there's way too much to do. So I joined him and, uh, there were 14 people in the office the day that I joined. Um, there were six people in the call center. There were six other VPs and there was Brian. And then I was number 14. And when I left six and a half years later, we had 3,100 employees system wide and we have gone from 2 million to 106 million in six years. And I, I ran everything except IT and finance. So. Amazing. You know, it, it's the people that we get around. I always have told my kids, they're young adults now. I said, you know, your job will make you a living. Your Rolodex will make you a fortune. It's the people we get around. The opportunities that come my way as a result of my network is just uh, um, amazing. Yeah. Well, that's why I joined, like I'm, I'm a member of two golf clubs, one in Phoenix and one in Vancouver. I'm a member of a tennis club here in Vancouver and I go to four different mastermind events every year. And then I go to TED every year. It's, it's, it, your network is your net worth. Yeah. And it's, it's the, the days of thinking we had to memorize everything was really kind of the 1980s and 90s when we didn't have the internet. But now it isn't what you know, it's who you know. And it's, it's your relationships with those people and how much you can help them as well so that you're, you know, 
you just all can help each other. You know, I get asked an awful lot, you know, what is the secret of upgrading your network? Um, what would you tell the audience? If you're the smartest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room. And I think in a lot of ways, we get into this part where we're in a network we feel safe in, we feel good in, people like us, our business is strong. Well, then it might be time to, to join another one. And it doesn't necessarily mean you leave, but you know, at some point you, you leave the Cub Scouts and you go on to Scouts and then you leave Scouts and you go on to something else, right? Well, I think at some point you need to add a couple groups or move into a couple groups. So, you know, in my strategic coach group with Dan Sullivan, I'm in his personal group. I mean, Peter Diamandis is a member of my group. You know, Joe Polish is a member of my group. Dave Asprey from Bulletproof Coffee is in my group. So I'm with these people that are running really big businesses. In strategic or in Genius Network, um, which is Joe Polish's network, it's 25,000 a year to be a part of it. You go three times a year to be there, but we're with like the founder of ClickFunnels is, in, is a member. The founder of Infusionsoft is a member. Vern Harnish is a member. You know, so they sit in the room with you. Like when Vern, the guy who started EO, is in a mastermind group with me, then you realize you're in the right room, yeah. right? Um, so, this, yeah, you just, I, I just keep leveraging up that way. Like I'll go to the TED conference next week. I mean, Bill Gates is in the audience, not speaking. You know, um, Al Gore is in the audience. Demi Moore is in the audience. Like you're with the real connectors and the real, um, the real business elite. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I'm a trainer for uh, Tony Robbins. And people ask me all the time, hey, you know, can, can you get me an in, invite to, uh, to meet Tony? I said, sure, it's, it's easy. Just be somebody that he wants to meet. Yeah. You know, I, met, I met Tony last year. He spoke, he spoke to us at the Genius Network. He came in and spoke for an hour and a half at Joe's event. And it was only 300 people that did the event. And Tony came and spent the hour and a half. And we got to talk to him behind the scenes afterwards. But I'm going to his, uh, his event in December down in Palm Beach. Oh, that's, that's awesome. I, uh, hopefully I'll be one of your trainers. There you go. Yeah. So, so again, like that's what you do though, is you put yourself in the room with these other people to continue to grow. And then I delegate everything else on my business. And I think where a lot of entrepreneurs are, oh, I'm too busy to join. Well, that's why you join because you need to work on your skills and on your network. You don't need to be doing, running the business. You need to, to figure out how to get people to run it for you. Karen, what's some of the uh, principles in double, double, that you can share real quick with the audience that they can take and execute today? The first is really around culture that I, I think people misunderstand how to build a great company culture. You know, your business has to be a little bit more than a business, a little bit less than a religion. It has to be in that zone of a cult. And it's not about giving out the free stuff. You know, the media talks about, oh, the great company culture and all the free things that they're giving away, like the free massages and the Wii Room. And that's not what culture is. Culture starts with alignment with vision. And then it's having all the right people and the systems to bring the right people into the company and quickly get the cultural cancers out of the company. And then it's all the communication tools, whether you use, you know, top down, bottom up, lateral communication tools within the organization. And then it's the actual environment that you work in. So I just codify all of those systems. And I've coached people now all over the world. I think in five countries, I've coached the number one or number two company in their country to work for. Um, so I've coached probably 30 companies that rank in the top 10 in their country to work for and they weren't even in existence when I started working with them. So to codify how to build your company into a magnet to, to create talent. You know, we ranked as the number two company in Canada with 1-800-GOT-JUNK. Wow. So the culture components, I guess, are key. Um, there's some stuff in there related to how to generate free PR that's pretty powerful. You know, I think a lot of people think that you know, there's investigative journalism, but there's not, you know, there's not a lot of journalists out there digging to find a story. It's how do you reach out to them and give them a good story? Cause they're all looking for something to cover. So I talk about how we landed the 5,200 stories at 1-800-GOT-JUNK and again, in all the companies that I've built since. Um, and then we, we get into the area of vision in double double, but I really codified it in my book, vivid vision. And the idea there is that most entrepreneurs have got an idea of what their company looks and feels like, kind of like an internal movie about what our company looks like three years from now, but we don't communicate it to people. And imagine if everyone in your company could see what you could see, they'd then be able to put the plans in and execute for you with the same level of intuition you've got. So I codify how to create that, that vivid vision and how to um, you know, circulate it to your employees and your customers and your suppliers so everybody can see what you can see. You know, Cameron, so often entrepreneurs get hung up on the ego of the revenue. You've got to be able to execute in order to create the revenue. 
Yeah. But then the revenue, you've got to turn that into profits and eventually the profits into cash. Um, what do you, why do you find that so often people stop at that revenue or the, the employee number? There, there seems to be this uh, addiction to size, growth, uh, presentation versus, you know, at the end of the day, here's my cash flow. Well, it's interesting. So I actually get all my clients that I coach to come up with four goals for the year. And the goals are set in this order. Employee satisfaction using net promoter score. Customer satisfaction using net promoter score. Your profit target in terms of a pure cash number. And then your revenue. And I think most companies set it the other way. They set their revenue goal first. So I want you to really obsess about employee engagement, employee satisfaction first, knowing that that will drive your customer engagement, which is where all your profitability will come from. You know, the only reason we even have customer service departments is one of four reasons. Your product sucks, your service sucks, you've overset expectations with your customers, or you don't have enough solid FAQs on your website. You take care of those four things. You don't need customer service departments at all which drives more positive engagement with your customers and drives your cost of overhead down because you don't need a customer service team. Like when was the last time we phoned Amazon with a problem? <laughs> Never. Because yeah. their product is amazing, their service is amazing, their FAQs are bulletproof and they've set really clear expectations. So I think if we can focus on that, that's why most companies go, they, don't, they just don't understand. They're, they haven't been given a better way. So I learned this 30 years ago when I was with College Pro Painters, the very first thing they asked me as a franchisee, I was 20 years old and I had 12 employees. They said, how much profit do you want to earn this summer? And I was like, I don't know. And they said, would you like to make, how about $14,000? I'm like, whoa, if I can make $14,000 in 1986? I was like, I'm like, yeah, that would be awesome. They said, well, do you know how to do that? And I said, no, well, to make 14,000 in profit, you need to do this much revenue. Sorry, my uh, Apple Watch decided to, to help me out figuring out my revenue goals. Um, <laughs> so the, uh, the, when, you, when you backward schedule it, like you start with profit, it tells you how much you need in revenue. And then from revenue, you know how many customers you need. And then you know what your sales funnel is going to be like. And then you know your marketing activities. Yeah. But, but entrepreneurs don't think that way. They're, they're about bragging. They're about my company's bigger. Well, in fact, I couldn't get my sister to join EO for 10 years because she knew that so many of the entrepreneurs that are in EO weren't making any profit. She's like, this is stupid. Yeah. Like, why would they work so hard to make so little money? And um, now she's in EO and she does, you know, she makes huge money. Uh, she's on an acquisition spree right now, acquiring a bunch of companies in her space as well. And yeah, it's interesting because when we start our uh, consulting engagements, we always start with the, the vision. What, what sort of vision are you trying to create? Not only for the business, but for your life. But let's make sure that you design your business to support your vision of your life because nothing's worse than having a, an amazing business that drives away your family, leaves you, you know, um, unhealthy and in an environment that you didn't really intend to get into. And yeah. so often they, they, it's all about reverse engineering as far as I'm concerned. You know, figure out what you want. And I love how you start with the, the profits and work, uh, work backwards. Well, and, and so even in my book, Vivid Vision, I talk about articulating and codifying a personal vivid vision a family vivid vision, and then a vivid vision for your company. So you have this series of three documents that describe your life and your family life and your business. And then you, you and your employees or you and your family or you and your friends can figure out how to reverse engineer that and make it come true. Exactly. And then you get accountability partners to help hold you accountable to it, which is why like the EO forums or YPO forums are so powerful is you have that shared group of, of like-minded people. But I think we need stuff outside of our business as well. Yeah, no question. That's why we actually started our paid accountability um, programs uh, where instead of just being partners, you pay someone that holds you accountable. And uh, a client actually today sent me a, a screenshot of one of my events where I'm pointing at somebody. It was like, get this done. And he goes, I put this on my uh, phone as my screensaver. Now, every time I turn my phone on, I see you pointing at me, get it done. That's awesome. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was good. You know, I was a COO of an organization that I started and it was probably one of the toughest jobs I ever had. You know, I, I truly believe that that's the toughest job in the entire organization. The, the what, if you had any advice for COOs, what, what would be one or two things that you tell, you know, this is what, this is your job, but what, what are you focused on the most? What, what, what's the most likelihood for success? What do they need to focus on? 
Yeah, it's interesting. And this is this is really the core reason why we started the COO Alliance. We're actually getting ready to roll out in 30 cities over the next three years with the COO Alliance. Um, and again, there's no entrepreneurs allowed. It's only for second in command. So entrepreneurs can't join, can't come. It's only for their second in command. So the first thing is the role of the COO is to make the CEO iconic. Mm. It's our job to make them look good. It's our job to build their business. It's our job to figure out the how to their why. So when we realize that, you become almost like the yin and yang relationship. It's a pure business partnership like a spousal relationship would be in a marriage. And then you kind of divide up all the roles. You divide up the pink jobs and the blue jobs. You divide up the, your spouse's roles and your roles. And you figure out what stuff do you like to do around the house and what don't you like to do. Like I like unloading the dishwasher and loading the dishwasher, but I can't stand washing dishes. Right? I like, I like cooking, but I don't really like barbecuing. So you figure stuff out. Um, well, in your business, it's the same thing. I didn't like IT and I didn't like finance. And Brian at 1-800-GOT-JUNK did. But I loved the operations and the execution and the planning and the culture and PR and sales. And, and he didn't like it and didn't understand it and hadn't really done it. In fact, I only actually ever spent a half a day in the trucks hauling junk. Because I didn't know how to haul. I didn't need to know how to haul junk. I just needed to know how to grow a company. He needed to understand the junk business and the trucks and what was going on. That didn't matter to me so much as how to scale the entire operation. So it's about making sure that he's iconic, making sure that he looks good so that when we had bad news to roll out, I rolled it out. If we had good news to roll out, he'd roll it out. And then there was that, that shared trust and, and Brian always made me look good inside the company and I made him look good inside the company, but it was very, very much that partnership role. And it's very different, as you said, it's, it, it's harder in a lot of ways than the other C-level roles because there's a very implied position where if he's sick or she's sick as the CEO and they're out for six months, it's really you that's going to take over the operations of the business. Yep. So there's a huge amount of additional trust there. So Brian would often tell me things that he wouldn't tell the rest of the leadership team. You know, we had a, a small room off to the side of the back by the freight elevator that I don't think 98% of the employees knew existed. And it had beanbag chairs and whiteboards and we'd go and lock ourselves in this little room that was just an old storage room that had been converted, but no one knew it existed. I don't even think my assistant even knew it existed. Um, we would just go in and sit down half the time we'd sit and cry and just go, what the fuck are we doing? But, um, but was that safe place? So I think that's really the number one. And then the next one is to be able to, to really, really, really be the gut-wrenchingly honest truth sayer. You know, that the emperor has no clothes. Like, you can't wait to, to, for the kid to say he's naked when everyone else knows. So you have to be the one to tell them what's going wrong. You have to be the one to tell them they're screwing up. You have to be the one to say no to them because they need that. And, and the more that you are the real truth advocate for them, the higher the trust is because they realize that you've really got their back because no one else, everyone else is kind of placating to them or kissing their ass. Um, so if you, can, if you can find that delicate balance between making them good, look good and then in private, being able to say no, and this is wrong and this is why and this is what I see, that's when massive trust comes in as well. And don't you really see that that's our job even today and what you're doing is really with your clients to be that voice of, you may not want to hear this, but you need to hear this and I'm going to tell oh. you. Oh yeah, I, like I've got client, I've a client in Toronto that I've helped coach now from 3.2 million to 58 million in four years. And he said, I'm the only person that actually tells him the truth. And I said, well, I just say what everybody else is thinking and no one else has the courage to say. I don't really care. Like, you, yeah. it's my job to tell you. And I also think you're great and you're, you're doing it, but you're fucking this part up. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we have a responsibility. It. Right, and then let's fix it. Let's, let's work at it, so. Yeah. Absolutely. What's next? Uh, the CO Alliance is really the, the core. I mean, it's a huge, huge blue ocean and I'm getting like all kinds of YPOers and EOers are starting to, to register their, their um, second in commands in it. So it's to really, truly scale up that organization to have a safe place for the second in commands because my, my core purpose, my why is to help entrepreneurs make their dreams happen. Well, if I can make their dreams happen by educating and growing their second in command, then everybody wins. Yeah. And until you have that person in place, uh, I, I don't think you're a business owner. You have a business, but it actually owns you. And yeah. And, and our job is to grow something that spins off revenue and spins off free time and can build a legacy for us or, or allow us the opportunity to add other, other things. But we have to get out of that day to day and have it running for us. Yeah. 
You know, when I meet with an entrepreneur that says they want to sell their business, it's a completely different conversation when someone says, why would I ever sell this? I, I want to build this where this continues to grow and prosper, but I just don't have to be the person at the helm, you know, 24 seven. Yeah, it's interesting. I coach a few, um, a few CEOs over in India and one in Saudi Arabia and, and they don't sell companies. They build them and then they're running, you know, the, the EO or YPO or over there is running his two companies, his dad's two companies and his grandfather's one company. You know, they just pass them through the organizations, but they don't, they don't sell things. They continue to build and make them bigger and stronger and bigger and stronger. Now, I don't, I don't have a problem with building to sell as long as it's a very strategic and a highly leveraged exit. Like if you can really extrapolate, like to take some cash off, then go for it. Um, but otherwise, yeah, build a business that, that is a business, not you having to go to work 17 hours a day. Yeah. So many get that, uh, get that wrong. You know, I love what you said earlier when you were sitting in that room that nobody knew and almost crying of, you know, uh, we don't know what we're doing here. I, I think so often younger entrepreneurs get this sense of, you know, you get to this point in business and your life and your maturity that you just got all the answers and, and we don't, right? I mean, sometimes we have no idea what the right answer is. We just keep moving forward and we get knocked down and we just get you know, we pick ourselves up and just, just keep moving. Every day, this is the biggest thing we've ever run. So how are we supposed to know? It's like raising a kid. Like you just keep faking it, right? And hoping and trying. I, I was coaching the CEO of Sprint when he just started as the CEO of Sprint three years ago. And I was sitting in Marcelo's boardroom with him and we were going through his leadership team. We were looking at his org chart and he had a, a title on the org chart that he wasn't sure whether he was going to keep him or fire him. And we were talking about this guy and I said, Marcelo, you have to fire him. Like everything you've said is, is fire this guy. He goes, yeah, but he's been here for, I'm not going to give you the title. He's a C level. Yeah. Been here for so many years, like over a decade and C level and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, but again, last time I checked, you have the CEO title. And he goes, you're right. And he put a red X through the guy's name. Yeah. And, um, he needed coaching. You know, I think at some point it's like an athlete. You look at the best athletes in the world and they have coaches and a coach doesn't mean that you don't know how to do something. A coach means that you actually want to become highly, highly functioning in it. I think the school system really screwed us up. You know, we were getting tutors for what we sucked at. What we should have been doing was getting tutors for what we were great at. And we should have, we should have been allowed to drop the subjects that we suck at. Like I was terrible in French I had a French tutor for two years and now I don't even like French people, right? Like, um, but, but I was really good at public speaking. Like I, I won citywide speaking competitions when I was in grade school, but why didn't my parents get me a speaking coach? Yeah. You know, I think if we think about it that way, that if you have a business coach because you want to be the best in business, it's not because you're failing. Like I don't coach any, any failing companies. I coach really, really successful companies. You know, uh, Price Pritchett said in his, uh, his talk with me, you know, the most successful owners that he knows are not well-rounded. They are so lopsided, but they are extremely focused and pointed in a certain area, a certain skill set. Uh, yeah. There was a book called Eagle School or something. It's almost like a kid's um, cartoon book. And it talks about this turtle that goes to Eagle School to learn how to fly. Well, don't teach it's awesome. Them. You know I mean? Don't teach a turtle how to fly. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Like it just, and that's where when you discover your unique ability, when you find out the two or three things you're really good at, you love doing, you get energized from doing them. And those are different activities than the ones you're excellent at. Like I'm excellent at a lot of things, but I don't like doing it. Yeah. Yeah. But once you, and then if you can delegate everything except your unique ability, that's where you win. No, no question. Uh, let's finish up here. We're, we could go on for hours and hours, but uh, let's finish up here. For all the business coaches out there that are listening, what advice do you have for them? How do they build up to the point where they end up with, you know, the CEO of Sprint as their client? Well, I guess it's different. So I, I look at coaching on a spectrum from on the left side of the spectrum where you have the coach who uses the Socratic method to ask a lot of questions to get the person to uncover for themselves what they should do. That's a very different skill than where I am over on the other side. Now, on the far right side of the spectrum, I would say you're the consultant who is the expert that someone's hiring to do the work for them. I probably fall more in the middle as the mentor where I'm going to ask some questions, but I'm also going to tell you what to do, but I'm not going to do the work for you. I think you have to really figure out your niche and you either find a category that you're really strong in and maybe you coach just service businesses or maybe you coach just restaurants. Like I have a friend of mine, Rory Fat, who just works with restaurants, but he's got, you know, 5,000 of them as clients. 
Um, you know, um, so maybe you find a niche like that, or maybe you find a soft skill area and you only coach on NLP or you only, I think people have to, to re figure out what they're coaching on. You know, I'm very, very well known for coaching on growth and culture. I don't coach on finance. I don't coach on it and I don't talk to any of my clients about what they do. Like, I don't know anything about telco and I coach sprint. Uh, you know, I coached the guys at grasshopper.com on PR. I coached I Love Rewards on PR. I coached. So once you know that you're really strong on operations, execution, and culture, you keep that as your niche. And then my client types tend to be the five to $50 million companies that want to go from 50 to 500 million. You know, once I get to the billion dollar size, it's pretty much out of my game. The only reason I really coached Marcelo at Sprint and then his second in command was I, I kind of diagnosed him on a plane as being an entrepreneur. I told him he was bipolar and was on the spectrum for Tourette's and had ADD and he, he does and he is. And, um, and because of that, he knew that I understood the entrepreneurial world and he wanted to make Sprint more entrepreneurial. Interesting. That's great. So you're just sitting on a plane with him and he decided to, uh, to tell him that he has Tourette's and uh, bipolar. Well, he had, he had this nervous tick, which is oh. a sign of Tourette's and then yeah. the bipolar stuff. I saw the, the energy and the mania and then stress and energy and mania and stress. And then he was completely distracted the whole time, which is one of the big ones of ADD. And when I showed him all that he, and I drew some diagrams, he said, I need you to meet with my wife, Jordan, to talk to her about it, to show her I'm not crazy. I'm simply an entrepreneur. So we became friends and um, yeah. And then I ended up coaching his second in command, Jamie Jones for almost two years. Um, that's terrific. I actually yeah. have, I have a friend of mine that actually has a jet, a private jet, uh, share program and, uh, he just flies around. He doesn't, he's not flying anywhere on purpose. He's flying around just to meet the people in the, uh, in the private, um, airports. Yeah. So I don't fly coach anymore. I'll never fly an economy class again yeah. because the chance of me meeting a high level business exec in economy is way less than in, in first. And you know, I, I met the second in command of a country. So I started coaching the, the guy who owns the country of Qatar or Qatar. And, um, you know, that was a, a six figure multi, like a, a pretty large contract just because I was sitting in first class and met them. Yeah. Same here. Uh, for the same reason. And yeah. nowadays, first class isn't that much more of a uh, coach. The way the airlines are now selling those seats as opposed to giving them away to uh, frequent flyers. Yeah, not at all. Well, Cameron, thank you very much for coming on today. I know You're your uh, time is extremely valuable. I really appreciate everything. And uh, tell the audience how they can get in touch with you. Yeah, the COO Alliance is COOalliance.com. And then all four of my books are on Amazon, Audible, and iTunes. So double, double, Meeting Suck, Vivid Vision, and The Miracle Morning for Entrepreneurs are all on uh, Amazon Audible and iTunes. Terrific. Thank you very much, Cameron. You're welcome, Thor. Thanks for having me on. appreciate it. My pleasure.